Welcome to the third episode of the Triple Seven Podcast, and today I want to unbox uh, a Joe Rogan podcast that it came out um, back in June with uh, guest Bob Lazar. And if you're interested in, in this at all, you should um, investigate the story yourself. It's a very spectacular story. Uh, a lot of people don't buy it, but in a nutshell, Bob Lazar back in 1989 supposedly had worked for a uh, military facility called Area S4. And a lot of people mis misconstrued the fact that he he was not actually at Area 51. It's 15 miles south. S4 is south of Area 51. And he is the reason why Area 51 is even known to the public. But he came out to the, to the public back in 89, making all sorts of crazy claims. And uh, he, he goes in, into very deep depth on, on these claims on Joe's podcast. And uh, I just wanted to get on the topic of possible alien life um, and my interpretation on, on what he said. And in the podcast, he said that he worked at S4 for only six months, but he had seen a not only one but nine crafts that were somehow um, recovered and he's going through the briefings when he's first hired and they I think it's kind of BS but in, in the briefings it says that the these crafts were for were, were retrieved from the Zeta reticuli star system binary star system that's like 30 light years away or something like that um, I don't buy that part. That part sounds a little, little. How would they possibly know that that's where it's from? But anyway, in in the podcast, the meat and potatoes of this, in the podcast, he is describing this reactor that produces its own gravitational field. With it, it's powered with this element one fifteen, and this is the one fifteen is one of the biggest things part of his story that makes me buy it and it's it's very convincing because he was talking about element 115 which at the time didn't exist on the periodic uh tables in and in 2000 and mid 2000s they were able to synthesize a very unstable version of it but he's he's claiming that the stable version of this element 115 is what the reactor was powered off of which gave its 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 gravitational uh, generating ability and he went there to basically replace a couple scientists that moronically try to cut into a, a reactor while it was running um, that's the story that he was told and and he's describing what he's seen he's describing the inside of this craft he'd only seen it on one occasion and it's up to you to, to, to buy a story or not uh, a lot of people don't buy it because it's the stuff that he's saying is completely like totally crazy, but he's pretty convincing. He's pretty convincing. He said on one occasion he was able to look on look into the first level of this craft and there were no right angles of any kind. Um, there was just these three little seats and the reactor sat in the center, and uh, and he he had a chance to kind of hang upside down and look at the, the level below where there were these, these gravitational uh, director sort of uh, parts uh, that would actually project it forward. And um, <clears throat> everybody wants to run to aliens, and of course it's easy to point to aliens. Um, this is my interpretation. If what he's saying is true... I don't think he's he's full of shit, but if he if what he's saying is at least partially true, um, why does it have to be aliens? Why? Because what are the odds? Even though there's no doubt that there's aliens out there, what are the odds that that a civilization had been able to travel light years through the vacuum of space to reach us and us not know about it? It is way more likely that that if these crafts, these nine crafts, were real, they probably have always been here. 
It makes more sense to me that they've always been here. That's why they're here. Um, and it, it this ties into a lot of stuff that I talk about. It ties into the the more mysterious uh, mysteriousness of, of our past and not only our past as far as our species, but our, our, our cousins, you know, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, um, so on and so forth, that we are hybrid, a hybrid species. And I'm totally, it, it makes way more sense to me that these crafts had always been here and then they probably weren't made by humans. Either humans made them and we used to be far more intelligent than we are now or uh, an unknown human species had created it. And we already know, I already know, and I'm already convinced that the fingerprints of the technology is all around the world. And what I'm talking about is, is megalithic architecture. And that, of course, includes uh, pyramids. Not all pyramids are built uh, megalithically, but megalithic architecture in particular, which means, you know, just massive stones fit together, fitting together um, in a very puzzling way that makes you look at it like, geez, man, I don't know. Because it's not that humans don't have the capability of, of creating some pretty spectacular stuff. The dynastic Egyptians, the Romans, the Greeks, they all were able to build fantastic um, architecture. But if you get this big piece of stone, right, this gigantic big piece of stone, it just doesn't, it's too much work to try to move that one stone. It would, it would make more sense, it would be a lot easier to cut it up in little pieces. You know, that the Romans had done that all throughout the time that they've been around. So when you start to investigate these different sites in Egypt, there's a lot of weird stuff in South America. Uh, Turkey's got some weird stuff. Um, England's got Stonehenge. There's tons of pyramids that, that aren't really able to be examined in China. The builders of the megalithic architecture it seemed like it was easy for them. It seemed like they were able to do it over and over and over again and that they were making a point like, look what we can do. Anybody can cut up this one stone into a bunch of different pieces and, and make something. But to, to, I mean, some of the stuff that's in Egypt is, it's eerie. It's very weird. Fascinating, but it's, I get like a very eerie feeling because you get these, gigantic columns of solid rock out of granite and it's you know it starts out like this like a column of course everything's all broken up you know there's no solid pieces because it's so old it's been around for so long and probably some type of cataclysm uh is thrown in the mix but you know you get these pieces of these gigantic columns that start out skinny and then they come out to like a lotus flower and it if you know anything about how we do stuff today that looks like something that was made on like a cnc machine something that you know you take a high school class and you put in you know the codes and, and the coordinates or whatever and you hit enter and it this little drill is computerized and it makes it literally drills it out for you perfectly it's kind of, it, it reminds me of something like that you know the the megalithic builders of uh, the ancient day it's like it was easy for them it was like it was easy for them and um, I don't think I don't I'm not one to say that we couldn't do that today probably would be way harder than than because I, I hear a lot of people that say that we can do that today which we could maybe but how much money if t t to be able to to make to try to recreate even half the size of a pyramid that's in Egypt, the Great Pyramid, how much money would it take? How much manpower? How much you know equipment? How much time would it take? It would be a, an enormous project that no one would be willing to to pay for. But we will never know until some crazy bastard comes along and, and tries to to recreate what had been done in the very ancient past. So my connection between the, the aliens 
Uh, what Bob Lazar supposedly had worked on is, I think that it's oh, it had always been here. And it, again, it solidifies my theory that our, our ancestors were, were interacting with other hominid species. That is a fact. You can't deny that. There is factual evidence that we had been interbreeding with Neanderthals and this other uh, hominid species, Denisovans. We don't even know what they look like. The only reason why we know that they exist is because the tip of a pinky bone was found in a cave. And this one cave in particular is called Denisovan Cave in Russia. Um, there's evidence that Denisovans, Neanderthals, and humans all had once inhabited it. it maybe not all at the same time, but there's, there's tons of articles out there that that there had been some interbreeding going on. So that right there should just open up your mind a little bit to the possibilities. Like, we don't know who built this stuff. We want to take credit for it. The humans did it. The Egyptians want to take, I don't know if they purposely wanted to take credit for it or if they moved in that spot. And it was already there as far as the pyramids and the Sphinx. And that for sure has happened all throughout the world. And at Machu Picchu and... Um, the Cusco area in Peru, um, uh, Lake Titicaca, and in that whole area, the, so the supposed Inca people had built this, and the, it, it's the story's been around for so long that the Inca are the last people that are known to have inhabited that area, so they're given credit for it. But the this is why I appreciate someone like Brian Forrester. He's got a YouTube channel. I've watched this stuff for hours and hours and hours. Check him out. Brian Forrester, he goes to these these indigenous areas and he asks the people that live there, which completely contradicts what you would read on the internet, what, what the theory is. And they say that it was already there. When their ancestors had gotten in that area, it was already there. And they had simply just, it was, of course, always found in ruins because it had been abandoned for who knows how long. But it all around the world and in many different sites you see these the aztecs are, are another example where these ruins were found and then they build on top of it but they were not able to, to re recreate the the stonework the stonework is so far beyond anything that that has been done since then and i cha i challenge anybody to to try to recreate some of the crazy shit that, that's on this earth it is just very weird um a little bit more about the megalithic architecture um, techniques, not really techniques, but uh, this site called Saxe Juan in Peru is a gigantic uh, zigzag, sort of like it goes for I don't know how many miles, but it's like a zigzag uh, wall, and there's like one layer, and then it goes up, and there's like another layer, and then there's another behind it, and I don't. This is something that I don't want to over, over complicate or overthink. Is the how the stones look? The stones look like they're pillows. They look like they're marshmallows, and I think it's really obvious. In in my opinion, and it's not only my opinion that somehow the stone was softened. Somehow the stone was softened. That would explain because there's different things that are very puzzling about megalithic architecture. Is how are they quarried? How were they moved to the spot? Because more often than not, this the quarry is very far away, very far away. These people were specifically going for specific stone, and they brought it to the site. Um, how were they lifted and shaped? In in uh, Saxo Homan, the the stones are unbelievable. Like they're they're as tall as a building, and they fit like a puzzle. There's puzzles. Their edges are 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 not. They're not just squares, blocks fit together. Although there are examples of that in Egypt, where there's just like square blocks perfectly fitting, no mortar, by the way, which you know any stonemason today would never do. You always use mortar, you always use filler. So to use stone on top of stone is like, what? Because because the shape of the stone, the foundation stone and the one on top of it need to be 
perfect. They need to be fitting together perfectly, and they are fitting perfectly together. It's extremely puzzling, and again, it's we don't know who built that stuff. Humans want to take credit for it, but I don't know, man. I'm I'm way way more open to the idea that uh, it's more likely too that aliens from another galaxy didn't come here but are they're already here that is an unknown species uh of our planet uh to bring up brian forrester again brian forrester has a series of uh many videos and in, in lectures where he discusses an area in peru called paracas paracas peru and he shows these um <clears throat> elongated skulls and he gives examples of Cranial deformation, which happens all around the world, um, it's it, it's obvious. You know, since people were children, since babies, their heads were wrapped against boards or something, and and you can see when you look at the anatomy of the skull, you can see where it's cranial deformation. And then there's these other skulls, and there's a lot of them where they they're you could tell they're genetically made. I should say they're genetically made like that, but they're grown like that. They're naturally elongated, and it's very weird because the skulls are huge. The eye sockets are huge. The jawbone is fucking huge. The teeth. It is a bigger version of us, and no one's talking about that. Brian Forster has has done a series of DNA tests in, in basically showing like where what area of the world. They had originated from, and he says that they come from the Black Sea area, and they were seafaring. They traveled by sea long, long ago, and they ended up on the coast of uh, Paracas, Peru. And there's always something weird about the South American um, folklore in in the skulls. Is there's always red hair, like the red hair is a very weird thing because it's something that you see over and over again the more you get into this the easter island or uh, the moai heads um have like these red hats on them but you know brian forster again went went there and asked well what is that that's not they say that that's, those aren't hats they, that's what that was their hair that was their hair that they put up in a bun like that and they had red hair uh, I think that could be a really important clue as to the identity of the, the people or the species that had done this megalithic architecture. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I'm probably going to have um, an extension of this conversation many times. But uh, if you'd like to check out Joe Rogan's podcast with Bob Lazar, it's extremely interesting. You'll probably won't believe it, but he's pretty he's convincing. He's pretty convincing and if the guy is lying then you know, I still give the guy credit, but it makes you wonder you know, the the history of our own past. I mean, this is something, I mean, let's assume that the government had spacecrafts from either another existence or another uh another civilization or that they were, have always been here and they just found them like the people need to know about that if that is true i'm not saying it is true because i don't have any evidence i'm just going off of my individual research and his testimony if it is true goddamn that is probably one of the most important things that the public needs to know about um and for whatever reason, it, it's it's being hidden. Even with all the independent research that I do with, with Egypt and, and the South America and all these other places around the world, it turns out archaeology is, is a dogma. You know, you get this, this history established and then, you know, lectures are taught and money is made and books are sold. And anyone outside of that is completely shunned and ridiculed. And there's no room for any new evidence or any new um, thought or, or even theories. It's and there is a lot of there's a lot of wacky shit out there. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of weird. I don't. I'm not the one guy to point to aliens all the time. Like the ancient alien shows. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. But it's like, man, it's it's not 
always aliens. Like it, it to me, it's way more likely that. I mean, the Neanderthals had it had been around for three hundred thousand years. That's more than we have been around. How much of their history that we don't know? And we know now that they weren't thuggish in in a a subhuman species. They were very intelligent. They had art. They buried their dead. They interbred with another hominid species as as as, as long. They inter they interbred with another species, the Denisovans, as well as us. I mean, how much of our history is gone? Unfortunately. So, I'm going to leave it there, Internet. Um, please like and subscribe if you'd like to. If you don't want to, that's cool too. And um, thank you for watching.